Before I start the real session, I want to say something that I forgot to say yesterday morning uh, when we started the conference, which was to give a big thank you to the Vienna Group, Heidi Ambrosch, Hilde Grammel, and the others for organizing the infrastructure, the resources, the room, the technology, and everything that was necessary in order to carry this conference. Thank you very much. Sir. And now I have the pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Gayatri Spivak and her introduction into one of the streams that we have in this uh, conference. You will have a lot of uh, sessions on this on feminist socialist organizing beyond Europe, and we called it like that, from an Eurocentric point of view, because this is where we're living and working and organizing. And, uh, but we wanted somebody with a broader perspective on the world and on feminist and socialist organizing to introduce these different sessions. We all know Vajatri Spivak, everybody is coming to listen to her, so I'm not going to do a detailed introduction because that will only take time away from her lecture and what we want is listening to her. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, I should like to dedicate this brief introduction to celebrate the memory of Fatma Munisi, the Moroccan feminist who died recently. This, so I'll read an extract from a few words I, uh, I sent to Berkeley, California, where they are celebrating her life. Saying a few words about Fatma Munisi, I give witness for an entire generation, my own. It is a generation that is now beginning to feel historical, a generation that contained in uneasy companionship, but no necessary organization or exchange. Fatma Munisi, Marie-Aimé Elie Lucas, Fatma Zora Imalayan, Farida Akhtar, Lucy Rigaray, Maria Antonietta Machoki, myself, and others. We were all born in the shadow of the Second War, which meant different things in different areas of the world. Our global accord was established before the word, quote, global became trivial, a buzzword to cover a multitude of sins. We came before the emergence of that meretricious identifier, the global south, although we had to contend with the third world. Yet we connected in a way that can only be called, quote, global, for the spirit of this closely strung movement, self-aware but not necessarily organized, was to occupy modernity. Our differences lay in how we negotiated tradition, not all of us wanted to occupy religion as well, but we acknowledged the power of that position. Irigaray's reading of Plato belonged there, and today, confronting the need to forge a subaltern gendered secularism in a country as diverse as India, I myself do perhaps begin to understand the usefulness of that position. That generation made it possible for women to tell their stories as evidence. We occupied the margins of dominant feminism. And in that spirit, making of myself an example, I recount a story. When in Nepal recently, I faced insane and humiliating public hostility from a proto-nativist white male Oxonian, I sought comfort with my stunning colleague, Lakshmi Subramanian, Dean of the Center for the Study of Social Science in Calcutta. It was her opinion 
she may be right or wrong, that, that rather than endlessly performing affirmative sabotage on the European Enlightenment, I was now beginning to make those moves for the sake of the constituency that was more moved by subcontinental Indian, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, etc., hegemonic epistemologies upon those millennial hegemonies outside of Europe, namely Guruvada, Guruism, role modelism, ancestor worshipism, and Matruvada, maternalism as reverse gendering totally beyond a vision of this guy who was insulting me in s such a terrible way, to totally beyond a vision of bureaucratic egalitarianism as the European Enlightenment itself trivialized. This is what Lakshmi told me. The first thing I thought of when she comforted me with this was Fatma Manisi insisting that she practiced tadbir. Her shadow haunts me. She was a woman of bitter irony and constructive, loving strength, a bridge builder. I hope we can continue to bring her vision and that of her generation forward into the present. Occupy modernity as we rewrite tradition. The papers included in these three sessions are excellent. I am here, however, not just to acknowledge the excellence of these papers, in fact, there is a chair for each session, but also to provide constructive criticism. In that spirit, I say that it is not a good idea to think of Marxism simply as a method of analysis, repeated in some of the papers, which can be set aside as we enter the field of ethnic and political identities. Identitarianism as resistance is not a variety of Marxism. I do not expect this to emerge in the Q&A, but I place it here as something someone in the audience might think about. To quote Marx with an appropriate time change, I quote, the revolution of the 21st century, he of course wrote the 19th century, the revolution of the 21st century will take its content from the poetry of the future. This is Marx. Please accept the comments that follow in that spirit, in the name of the poetry of the future. We think of this session, the first one, as, quote, global. Yet each paper is focused on a nation state or region. It is also noticeable that the papers from the United States are the ones that are openly optimistic and claim success. Please remember that I am speaking as an insider. The fact that I, I don't necessarily participate in the US in terms of those kinds of movements does not mean I have stopped being a feminist Marxist. These are not negative criticisms, but rather critique only in reference to our cognitive faculties and consequently to the subjective conditions of thinking the definition provided by the German classical philosophy which Marx affirmatively sabotaged for activism. This is a robust instrument for self-criticism. I'm myself subject to this also, and you will be able to spot this. Incidentally, my dear friend and ally, Judith Butler, has recently quoted a letter, here and there, I know about three occasions. Marx wrote to Arnold Ruge, when Marx was 25, as containing his notion of critique. In my estimation, Marx's notion of critique is spread like a watermark across his mature work. At any rate, as we know, the next year, 1844, when Marx was 26, he opened books on economics because he realized that journalistic and interventionist practice that did not challenge theorizing was not sufficient for future directions for social justice. At first, he wrote about, quote, national economy, national economy, as we do on our panel, the first panel today. The phrase national economy 
is routinely translated into English as political economy, thus ignoring the path that he traversed difficult paths from the wealth of nations to the management of capital across the globe. It is with a sense of that difficult trajectory that I would say to the participants that in order to acknowledge the global, we cannot simply focus on our activities in our area. Unless we think the local as fully global, because I think the global act local, that's a cheap uh, t-shirt thing. Unless we think the local as fully global, we cannot supplement the so-called globalists of the Euro-US with attention to borders, because development as exploitation, namely global, sustainable underdevelopment, keeps reckoning state by state. So the relationship between the state and the globe has to be thought in another way. I put it in this liberal anodyne way to Columbia University undergraduates a year ago. This is not suited to, to you or me, but this is how I put it. A Marxist feminist uses Marxist methods to bring about gendered social equality in the world and mindset change as well, outside in the world and inside in the mind. I have written about the epistemological changes necessary for feminist Marxists today in Global Marx. It's an essay with a quotation mark, with a question mark. An essay forthcoming in a memorial volume for the economist Stephen Resnick to be published by Routledge. If anyone in this audience is interested in checking it out, I will be in her debt. In the Argentinian feminist movement, women's rights and social justice in a Latin American perspective, Ana Gonzalez is speaking of a Latin American perspective which I first encountered in the comments, not gendered, by Luis Tapia on the work of René Mercado Savaleta of Bolivia. I consider it genuinely appropriate to the contemporary context where the subject of social justice has moved from labor to the gendered citizen into social movements, because as you know in this room, Bolivia is very, very unusual in having brought in a revolution on uh, social movements and the issue of water. They, they began with water, right? And then other things. I consider it genuinely appropriate to the contemporary context where the subject of social justice has moved from labor to the gendered citizen within which labor finds its place. I have commented in the following way upon this perspective in the paper that I have just cited as another word on the formation of democratic judgment. And my thanks go also to the Mapuche and the Aymara with whom, I, especially with the Mapuche, I am involved in some working way. They're not, the ones I'm associated with are certainly not identitarians. They are as I said about Manisi occupying modernity, I was just in Chile, and of course uh, this is not, they don't reflect, uh, they, they don't, they're not within nation state borders, with the uh, Mapuche, Aymaras, and so on. What, so this is what I said about this Zavaleta's uh, material, one-on-one -on -one and collective. Here is the altogether more careful alternative to consciousness raising of various sorts. Vanguardism, these are the consciousness raisings of the last century. Failed now, vanguardism to promote class consciousness, organizing for collective bargaining and job security, legal awareness seminars, citizenship training, identitarian voting bloc pre-party formation, gender babble encompassing all. This careful alternative, one-on-one -on -one and collective, millennially tested within race, class, gender parameters, the equivalent of what classroom teaching could be today, like the oral formulaic, yet so unlike the oral formulaic, the way in which the great epics were performed over and over again. Like the oral formulaic, yet so unlike. The collective question in this kind of a situation, how many are we? is rather different from paying membership dues. The ballot is secret. 
The early Bolshevik experiment of an open ballot came to nothing. The early Bolivian sense of this alternative did not receive this supplementation. One-on-one -on -one yet collective. In this sort of careful work of rearrangement of desire, to want to contain the march of capitalism, not just succeed at small businesses, to want to turn capital again and again into socialist rather than capitalist uses, to want to contain the march of capitalism, to want to respect the rights of others who do not resemble me, the politically correct formulas that circulate within our crowd are only extended to our self-consolidating other. You're in Germany, it's Turkey. You're in France, it's Algeria, etc. Not further. As I have said before, I do not think this should be appropriated for identitarianism, which leads, as I said, to voting bloc democracy, which is appropriate for short-term struggles, but not when we are thinking about the long-term future. Justified self-interest with civil society alliances is not Marxist feminism. In Women in Brazilian Trade Union Movement, Patricia Vieira, an old friend, does indeed consider globalization. I would be interested to know how the developments of 2016 have affected what she describes, how does it relate to the economic conservatism of BRICS, my own consideration, of course, uh, you know what that is, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and my own, and South Africa. Bricks. My own consideration, of course, has always been that Marxism is not only job security, as I said, although once again in the short run it is crucially important. The attendant epistemological change requires attention to the quality, not just the availability, of education in general from primary to tertiary and post tertiary and not just for income production. This is not really a question that I will hit Patricia with because it really does occupy a separate space from the tremendous importance of women's gendering of the trade union movement, which is not well known for good gendering in the contemporary context and is also mired in nationalism via objections to outsourcing. In reflections on Marxist feminist organizing in South Africa, where Jacqueline Koch and Hayat Fakla speak of building institutions outside of capitalism, I would hope that the speakers would answer two questions in the paper itself. One, how do they plan to bypass the corrective Marxist argument about subsumption under capitalism? If this is not confronted, they are back in the smallest beautiful era of the 60s with the difference that small business is now absolutely and routinely open to venture capital. And two, how does their organizing locate itself when they consider the global situation in South Africa within global potential funders and research and development, R&D, which is the biggest area where Marxist feminism must concern itself these days and which I do not see reflected yet in this conference, where the glaringly favored place of South Africa as compared to Sub-Saharan or continental Africa has moved old-fashioned Marxists to call South Africa a white country. I hasten to add that among these comrades, white is not a color, but a set of attitudes. My experience here is with R&D and the World Economic Forum in South Africa, most recently in Stellenbosch. In feminist struggles in the Middle East and North Africa, Selin Sagatai offers a positive picture. I am eager to hear the details of this, and my only question, no doubt answered in the extended paper, is a clarification of the word grassroots. My general experience of involvement through my friend and ally Hamid Baboshi in movements in this area has been that the leadership component, at least, is not, strictly speaking, from among the bottom feeders, a term I prefer to the more liberal uh, grassroots. My general critique of including the contradiction between liberty, uh, ipsaity, autonomy, me, 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 
and equality. Others who do not resemble me or my group may be thieves and jerks and dogs. Others who do not resemble me or my group, perhaps at all, even in the most urgent struggles for redress, always stand for a generalized future, however useless it might seem at the time of struggle. If we do not attend to the class apartheid in the quality of education, even at such times, the culture of rape bribery and violence will never disappear. And here, my involvement is with the kinds of uh, templates and toolkits that are, that are being offered by the South African government to places like Durban, for example, where I'm quite deeply involved. And again, if you want to look at a piece called Humanities and Democracy, I will be very, very grateful. Denise Ulusai's oppression and resistance in Turkey is most intriguing in its abstract. I would like to know the class constitution of this generalized feminist subject, their organizational work, and its relationship to Marxism. I would also like to know how this optimistic note is situated within the strong, sometimes violent, containment of academic freedom in Turkey today. To the extent that many of us are involved in finding footholds abroad for politically active colleagues and former students from Turkey. With Feride Erlap's decolonial feminism and women's organizing against war in Turkey and Syria, we are not only in contemporary globality, but we have reached the extreme point where any organized program for social justice, such as Marxism, or indeed feminism, encounters a limit. I have written about this in the context of the subduing of Byzantium, the Eastern Empire, taking it back as far as I can. And then imperial envy of the Ottomans, followed by their subduing, emerging now in the Osmanli aspirations of Turkey today. And you know what we say in private among our friends is Vienna is the beginning of the Balkans. So to an extent, the idea of these Osmanli aspirations are very appropriate here. Imperial envy of the Ottoman, etc. The subduing of the Western Ottoman Empire was accompanied by rewriting the map of a quote Middle East with broken promises and the beginning of the construction of a bitter cultural memory through the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, creating, and this is a word from the document, condominium, which actually means arms held jointly, in this case, by the European powers in, quote, the Holy Land, which is also a quote from the document. The subsequent history of using legitimized violence and making no response possible produces the extreme situation described by Franz Fanon until you have a situation of no return. If a set of human lives are considered less important than another set of human lives, the response is violence. The, um, the point about the education of children, informing them of the intuitions of democracy that I make ceaselessly, and I just made twice, has here been turned around. A large, as large numbers of children are informed by the will to kill. Women organizing within this is a story of tremendous courage. Within the field of human trafficking in the old days, we often saw a patriarchally brainwashed woman form the first link. It's very surprising, but often true. Within the scene described by Eral, Erlap, sorry, women Ide ideologized into welcoming misogyny and violence are themselves items of horror. I should like to include here a few words written to me yesterday afternoon by Mahmoud Al-Zayed, a Syrian male exiled in India. I quote, I am the common Syrian. This has nothing to do with what I was doing. It just came because I have so many connections here and there, what Nora was talking about. I am the common Syrian whose dreams of freedom and justice are lost in the game of nation. This is what I'm talking about, right? Let's not just be nation focused. To the Syrian, and that's my critique of the critique, not negative criticism of the papers in the first session. To the Syrian who is caught up within the oppressive structures in the name of nation and religion. I'm referring too to the refugee, he writes, and the displaced inside and outside the country. 
To my mind, he continues, as people, we protest, resist, and speak out, but we do not have the mechanism so that our voice can be heard, and we do not have the mechanism to change the status quo. This can be applied to the Iraqi, Yemeni, Palestinian, and Libyan context, and one may say to the West Asian context in general. This is what he wrote to me. Anne Ferguson is also an old friend. I move now to the next, uh, next session. And I know I will enjoy listening to her account of alliances, and this is on the US as outside of Europe, to which some of us have a bit of an objection. We generally say Euro-US, I think. It's parochial to say, to count the US as outside of Europe because the context is not really appropriate to our general sense of globality. However, I live in the United States and have lived there for 55 years and carry a 55-year-old green card, so I'm here, I'm there too. Anne Ferguson is also an old friend and I know I will enjoy listening to her account of alliances. I have for her the same question as I have for Ana Gonzalez. Why is this Marxist? I'm not at all against alliances, but anti-capitalism is not necessarily building bridges toward a social system that will nurture, to repeat, a will to turn capital repeatedly to socialist rather than capitalist uses. I know both Annas will have a persuasive answer for me. Catherine Russell's paper strikes a hopeful note. I was amused to see that this paper talks about Marxist feminist analyses somewhat in contrast with Ana Gonzalez's paper, but perhaps this is a trivial point, although I do not think so. In the matter of sustainable development, I would want us to align with feminists like Amina Muhammad, the Nigerian Minister for Environment, and Alicia Varsena, Executive Director of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean for the United Nations, who both insist that all sustainable development initiatives today sustain, and they know what they're talking about, sustain the maximum of the market and the minimum of whatever is called development. Whereas development in the correct sense should shape the market rather than vice versa. This is an impossible goal to achieve, but Amina and Alicia are very strongly resolved to do something about this and they have some power. This is an impossible goal to achieve, but it might work if there were a critical mass of Marxist feminists for such a change to come into being, at least temporarily, until the sustainable underdevelopers find a loophole. My position is slightly more extreme. I have defined development as insertion into the circuit of capital with no subject formation in a forthcoming collection edited by Anne Stoller. Again, if anyone in the audience reads that piece, I will be in her debt. As for the Pan-African project intervening in research and development in Nigeria, there is no time for that discussion. I have the greatest sympathy and support for Black Lives Matter and work as hard as I can to save it from the ferociousness of US identitarianism and from the well-meaning hyperbole of reverse ethnocentrism. What I admire about the movement is its repudiation of violence. I want to refer here slightly more in greater detail to Fanon, who insists that the tragedy is that the very poor among, the, among them, the peasantry in um, Fanon's Algeria, untamed by bourgeois socialization, they are reduced to violence because there is no other response possible to an absolute absence of response and an absolute exercise of legitimized violence from the colonizers. Their lives count as nothing against the death of the colonizers, unacknowledged Hiroshima's over against sentimentalized 9-11s. Neither Marxism nor feminism is directly involved here, but the pacifist anti-identitarian effort sustained by the members of Black Lives Matter themselves must be kept up. Nancy Holstrom tells us that theory has some less direct implications for practice, and I quite agree. If theory is what we teach at Research One universities in the US, it is available to a select few 
who can talk the talk but never have any intention of walking the walk. Also, the ones who learn theory are interested in applying it to whatever they're working on, and this instrumentalizing of theory makes it a dead end. This is not the place to discuss teaching theorizing as a practice that is normed in the field of work, both above and below. And in my sad experience, you know, we can say the formula, capitalism, patriarchy, etc. And in my sad experience, and I lived in an actually existing socialist state, in my sad experience, plenty of communists are also patriarchal and racist. So the latter two, racism and sexism, seem bigger than capitalism. In fact, the extreme global popularity of corporatist feminism is a case in point. Let us move on to wages for housework, which she also mentions. It is a very important issue, but somewhat parochial because it assumes a certain kind of household. It cannot move to the largest sectors of the electorate in Africa and Asia. For reasons of time, I cannot discuss this issue here. It also cannot move to the area's arena of war-devastated women in camps plagued by poverty and rape, whose number is in the millions now. Professor Holstrom is, however, a much respected figure in the academic circles I inhabit, and I offer these points with appropriate humility towards her extensive experience in uh, Marxist feminist struggles in the US. Nora Retzel had sent me Gabriela Dietrich's abstract, but I now see that she has been moved to a parallel session. I include my words on her anyway, to her anyway, and that will be, be my final movement. Gabriele Dietrich has been an activist in India for many decades. What is most impressive for me is her command of Tamil. I believe that it is through the acquisition of a language almost on the level of one's first language that one actually earns the right to join in struggles where identity is calculated another way. This is what makes me a comparativist. I have long wanted to meet Ms. Dietrich, and I'm glad of the opportunity I just met her. I take the question in her elegantly worded title seriously, a flower on the chain or a tunnel toward liberation, question mark. I will read just a bit of her abstract since she's not going to be in our sessions. I read her abstract. The engagement with religion in the Indian women's movement was in full swing in the mid-1980s when a gap was perceived between, quote, secular feminists, often middle class, and, quote, ordinary women who were seen as being, quote, religious. There were attempts to bridge the gap the 80s were also marked by the struggle for a, uh, for a secular, quote, uniform civil code, why do I know that story, which was hoped to be more gender just than the religious family laws. This struggle was then manipulated by chauvinistic religious forces. The destruction of the Babri Masjid in December 1990 aggravated the religious polarization between Hindus and Muslims and led to stronger influence of patriarchal forces in different religions and assertive patriarchal controls over women's lives. Re I continue with her abstract. Religious polarizations achieved a new quality with the communal attacks on Muslims and the massacres of early 2002 in Gujarat after the Godra train fire incident. The majority communal forces are in the meantime in power at the center since over two years at the center, meaning the central government and uh, our prime minister. The attempt to create a, quote, Hindu nation with cow worship and beef ban promoted by self-appointed vigilantes, lynching, in fact, prevailing over the protection of human life, this precarious situation has led to agitations for women's rights to enter sacred places, temples, dargahs, mosques, participation in pilgrimage, and controversies over purity and pollution, menstruation, etc., have been carried out in the public sphere in unprecedented ways. Muslim women have asserted their rights to maintenance under secular laws, and Bohra Muslim women are fighting against genital mutilation." End of quote. 
The right to secular maintenance and to unmutilated genitals are beyond criticism. But does the right to participation in religions, about which I read with great interest in the radical magazine Frontline some months ago, does this make a change in the general theocratic conversion of what used to be called, even then wrongly, the world's largest democracy? How does this relate to Marxism? Speaking of Fatma Mernisi, I talked about negotiating tradition. This is where my question is lodged. The killing of Muslims and Dalits for association with beef, the shooting of left intellectuals for anti-government positions, the violent curtailment of academic freedom are not touched by women's entry into religions. My own work, certainly not comparable to Professor Dietrich's and deliberately with no cyber presence at all, has been among the largest sector of the electorate and there these questions do not matter and cannot be implemented even if they did matter. Women there do not have money to go to temples and my, I know what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about. The temples are located elsewhere. I should, and anyway, these are untouchables. I should add that as far as I can and in a pan-Africanist spirit, I have the same kind of involvement on a slightly higher level of abstraction since I do not have a command of languages with the largest sector of the electorate in a couple of African countries and for quite a few decades now. And I'm sorry to see that there is no one from Sub-Saharan Africa on our Global South stream. Just one more word about India. The World Economic Forum is sitting in Delhi even as we speak. It has reported that whereas poverty levels are highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, the highest no number of poor people in the world is in India. I personally work away at this, certainly, but this is not my session. I will report the World Economic Forum's suggestion, enthusiastically supported by the government and the corporate sector in India, the North and the South, that the best way to deal with this is foreign direct investment. Who doesn't know that this is a bad, bad idea? Feminist Marxists might fix their glance here. In considering Hinduism, Fatma Mernisi was most concerned with the acknowledgement of human inequality that the caste system described. This generation of my co-workers and students in the Indian villages where I have my elementary schools now where I teach for 30 years, they can tell you that there are two castes in the world. By now they can, rich and poor. And here is Marx on that primitive caste system and that will be my final move. How does money making at others' expense begin, Marx asks. His answer, which relates to agribusiness and industrial capitalism, cannot be a part of our discussion today for lack, lack of time. But what he suggests is, is the business sector's common sense assumption implicit in much of our right and left activism today. I quote Marx, long, long ago, there were on one side a diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite, and on the other, lazy, ragged characters who blew off all they had and more. The legend of the theological fall of man may tell us how man came to be cursed to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow. The history of the economic fall of man, which he's talking about, reveals to us how there were people who did not need this at all. Same difference. So it came to pass that the former, writes Marx, Marx, accumulated wealth, and the latter finally had nothing to sell but their own skins. And from this fall dates the poverty of the great masses that up to now, despite all their labor, have nothing to sell but themselves, and the wealth of the few that increases constantly, although they have long ceased to labor. Now, th this, of course, is not the correct uh, account, says Marx, and he goes to agribusiness and in industrialization of land, etc., but we can't go there. This is something like caste, if you like. Some people are just not good enough. Others superior to them must, quote, help them by letting them serve. That is the story that justifies inequality. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most important historians and soci sociologists of the 20th century, himself African-American and unflinching in the work of justice 
for African Americans used the word caste when necessary to distinguish this from issues of race. He was able to think beyond identity politics, as was Marx. Du Bois was able to see the reflection of caste in the brutalization of poor whites, a lesson teachers like ourselves must remember in the context of violence against blacks, let us say, in Ferguson and elsewhere today. Just as in the case of rape, we must see caste in the apartheid in education so that below a class line, men learn to accept rape culture as normal. Those above that line have no excuse, also a caste thought. And to take a final point here, from Himrao Ramji Ambedkar, who presented a paper called Castes in India in 1916, and suggested that the caste system in India should be explained not in terms of race, as people commonly think, but in terms of how societies have different methods for treating surplus men and surplus women, 1916. Ambedkar was born into a so-called untouchable caste. Today, the word used would be Dalit or oppressed. Thus, this idea that there are people essentially capable of helping and essentially incapable who must be helped and therefore to be cared for by providing service is operative within race and gender and can be used in justifying economic class. This mindset, falsely justifying so-called primitive accumulation, as we saw in Marx, survives in our world. We must help the developing countries. They have not been capable of helping themselves. This is a major problem of gender development activities within international civil society that in anyone living in New York City will become identified with. This is also a major problem when we talk about gender as if we ourselves represent the group that should be called women. Marxism is not simply a mode of analysis. It is a gendered mode of changing the world through theorizing as a practice. And we have to rewrite it because it is not sufficiently gendered and also because the working class is no longer our only hope, but you rewrite it through critical intimacy, not setting aside saying it's only analysis, a kind of body-mind separation. I work with people who have been millennially denied the right to intellectual labor, and it really hurts me, physically hurts me, to see the elite setting intellectual aside, saying it's only theory. And also because, so we have to rewrite it, because it is not sufficiently gendered, and also because the working class is no longer our only hope. Gendered citizenship is the subject agent position. I repeat then, let us supplement the global national rather than remain simply focused on our nation and region, even if we are nicknamed the global south. Thank you.